Hello there. I want to talk to you about a question we're all asking ourselves these days. Is it time to cut the cord? Not that cord, the umbilical cord. Let's talk about delayed cord clamping. I have a few objectives for this video. I want to describe the clinical evidence for delayed cord clamping. I want to give the evidence around the nuts and bolts of how to perform delayed cord clamping. And lastly, I want to remind us all of the initial steps that must be done for every baby while they're getting delayed cord clamping. But first, my disclosures. I have no financial conflicts of interest. I am opinionated about delivery room care, including the practice of delayed cord clamping, though I will be doing my best to objectively present the data. But giving the data and my opinions that may go with it does not constitute clinical advice. Delayed cord clamping presents a perfect opportunity for the obstetric and neonatal team to have a collaborative moment. I have found a simple question that can really start the conversation is, is there any reason we can't do delayed cord clamping? I like that it starts a dialogue, and I like that it is framed in a way to look for reasons to not do delayed cord clamping rather than finding reasons to do it. But whatever way you start this conversation, you must have this conversation between the delivering team and the resuscitation team, preferably before the baby comes shooting out. Because guess what? The moms know all about it. In fact, they may just start demanding it, so we need to know all about it too. Darwin knew it. Erasmus Darwin, that is. Charles's grandfather. He was a physician, and he described the benefits of delayed cord clamping very well. He noted that the cord should not be cut until the baby had repeatedly breathed, because otherwise there was a portion of blood left in the placenta, which ought to have been in the child. William Potts Dewey's was a pioneer and founder of perinatal medicine in North America. In his textbook, he said, when respiration is established, either spontaneously or by artificial means, we apply a ligature to the cord, provided pulsation has ceased in it, but not until then. Amazing! Modern science is just now catching up to what we seem to have understood 200 years ago. In 2017, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, ACOG, put out a position statement on delayed cord clamping. They recommended a delayed cord clamping for vigorous babies for 30 to 60 seconds after birth. And they make the point that delayed cord clamping does not increase the risk of maternal postpartum hemorrhage, which has been a fear. The ACOG statement does give situations in which you should consider immediate cord clamping instead of delayed cord clamping. I tend to break them into two broad categories. One is if the patient is not doing well, if the mom is bleeding or unstable, or if the baby appears to need immediate resuscitation, or you know the baby does, like in diaphragmatic hernia. The second broad category is when the uterine placenta baby connection isn't working. No use leaving a baby attached to a cord that is not providing blood and oxygen to the baby. So an abruption, previa, or an IUGR baby with abnormal cord dopplers are examples. So let's talk about clinical evidence for delayed cord clamping. Do we have evidence that really supports that delayed cord clamping is beneficial for babies? The first question we should ask ourselves is, what is the purpose of delayed cord clamping? Is it mainly to transfuse blood from the placenta to the baby? Is it to help make a stable transition to ex-utero life? Is it both of these things? Is it different for term and preterm babies? Because what we think the purpose is will determine what outcomes we should be looking at. There is a meta-analysis done in 2013, which is the most recent I have found for term babies, and it shows that delayed cord clamping increases early hemoglobin levels, decreases iron deficiency at 3 to 6 months, and increases the need for phototherapy to treat jaundice. Many factors were looked at that showed no difference such as these. I would interpret the significantly different outcomes as being related to placental transfusion, while the outcomes that might hinder the stable transition are the ones that are not different. There are newer papers looking at this placental transfusion benefits in term babies. One paper showed improved iron stores at four months, and they also showed improved brain myelination using MRI. Another paper looked out longer and used a 12-month ages and stages questionnaire and found less at-risk scores in the group that received delayed cord clamping, and the number needed to treat was 10 to 14. But the details here are quite important. The first paper was done in the United States, and the comparison was immediate cord clamping of less than 20 seconds versus delayed cord clamping for greater than 5 minutes, not just 30 to 60 seconds like the ACOG statement. The second paper was done in Nepal, and the control arm was anything less than 60 seconds, and the delayed cord clamping arm was greater than 3 minutes. So it may be that the neural developmental benefits we hope for with improved iron stores takes longer than just 1 minute of delayed cord clamping. But what about the possible benefits of a stable transition for term babies? There is data looking at the normal changes in saturation and heart rate for the first 10 minutes from birth. This group started with the defined reference ranges, as we see in textbooks like NRP, which I am recreating here in cartoon form. Then they took data from an uncomplicated birth population attended by midwives that performed delayed cord clamping for on average 5 minutes. What they showed is that compared to the reference range, term babies getting delayed cord clamping had a shift up in normal saturations. 
the reference ranges for heart rate in the first 10 minutes actually show at first a sharp rise in heart rate that then gradually comes down over time. But in the population getting delayed cord clamping, there was no sharp rise and overall the baby showed just a gradual increase in heart rate over time. To put numbers to that graph, we have a more recent publication that randomized over 1,200 babies to early cord clamping or delayed cord clamping of 3 minutes and measured saturations and heart rate at 1, 5, and 10 minutes of life. Early cord clamping babies had lower saturations than delayed cord clamping with a mean difference of 10 to 18%. As with the other paper, heart rate was higher in the early clamping group compared to delayed cord clamping with a mean difference of 3 to 9 beats per minute. So I think there is some evidence that delayed cord clamping is making for a smoother transition for term babies, even if it does not result in changes in APGAR scores, NICU admissions, or mortality. When it comes to preterm babies, we have to start with the Australian Placental Transfusion Study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017. Many simply refer to it as the APTS or APS trial. It was a randomized trial of babies less than 30 weeks and compared immediate to delayed cord clamping. It is by far the largest study in the preterm population with about 1,500 babies enrolled. The primary outcome was death or major morbidity. The study has critics mainly because in the delayed arm, only 74% of preterm babies got the 60 seconds or more of DCC that they were randomized to. But the verdict was pretty straightforward. There was no difference. That's right, it was a negative study. You may have missed that when it first came out. Because there was that one secondary outcome. And it's a really important secondary outcome, death. And that is what the news stories ran with at the time. Here's an example from the Sydney Morning Herald from October 2017, touting the decreased mortality found in the arm that received delayed cord clamping. But the fact remains that the APTS had only this secondary outcome as positive. Everything else in the trial was negative. That is, no difference. There are now two meta-analyses that have included the data from the APTS trial, and they back up this conclusion. They both showed a significant reduction in mortality with delayed cord clamping, and though they have slightly different numbers, the risk ratio appears to be about 0.7. But the confidence intervals are fairly large and could be anywhere from 0.5 to almost 1. If we look at just one other outcome, we should look at IVH rates. This was one of the big disappointments in the APTS trial. The meta-analysis before the APTS trial seemed to be convincing that IVH rates are reduced with delayed cord clamping, and that is supported by the animal physiology but the APTS trial showed no difference in IVH rates. The APTS trial is large and has a lot of weight in the meta-analysis, and so in the first meta-analysis, there is no difference with the confidence interval crossing 1, and so not being significant. But the second meta-analysis had a confidence interval that did not cross 1, and so it was significant in favor of delayed cord clamping reducing IVH. But if we look at these numbers, I think they're really telling us the same thing. They are so similar. The risk ratio appears to be around 0.85, and it might be as low as 0.7, or actually not different. Well, I mentioned animal physiology, so what is the physiology evidence for delayed cord clamping? I love physiology, and I could probably talk for an hour just on this, but I don't really have time in this video to go over it very well. If you look up just one paper on the animal physiology, look up this one. After you read it and want to know more, just do a PubMed search of Dr. Hooper here, and read everything he has ever written. Based on the whole of their research, they have promoted the concept of physiology-based cord clamping. The basics of it is that if the baby breathes first, then the cord is clamped, you get an amazingly better transition in heart rate, pulmonary blood pressure, pulmonary blood flow, and carotid blood flow. Which leads them to make statements like this, lung aeration should be viewed as the central precipitating event that initiates a sequence of interdependent changes in physiologic function that characterize the transition to newborn life or as I less eloquently find myself saying in neonatal resuscitation education all the time, ventilation, ventilation, ventilation. Fine, you say. Sounds good for lambs. But is there any evidence that this matters in human babies? Well, I think this paper supports the idea of physiology-based cord clamping well. They reviewed over 15,000 resuscitations of newborn babies in a Tanzanian hospital and defined the times the baby started breathing in relation to when the cord was clamped. If the babies had the cord clamped and then the baby started to breathe, they are graphed on the left half, and the farther to the left, the more time between when the cord was clamped and the baby started to breathe. On the right half, the babies breathe first and then the cord was clamped, and the farther out to the right you go, the longer the time between when the baby first breathed and the cord was clamped. The babies that were first clamped and then breathed were bundled together and had a higher rate of death or NICU admission. But the babies that breathed before clamping had a much lower incidence of the outcome. And it was not just an all or none effect, but the longer the time between breathing and clamping further reduced the percentage of death or NICU admissions. 
Now I want to address some of the practical how-to points about delayed cord clamping and what practices around delayed cord clamping the literature supports at this time. I'll address each practice by asking a question about how you perform delayed cord clamping. Does height matter? We start with this paper from 1969. They measure the amount of blood left in the placenta, so the higher the volume, the more blood left in the placenta and the less that got into the baby. If we focus on the white bars, which was three minutes of delayed cord clamping, you see less and less blood being left in the placenta as we go from holding the baby 60 centimeters above the introitus to 40 to 20 to 10, and then to 10 and 40 centimeters below the introitus. But the most important part of this paper is that many review articles I have read on the subject point to this one article as being responsible for the change in practice away from delayed cord clamping, which before this was the norm in practice, and it might be partly because of this concluding statement in the paper. In C-section births, it would therefore be advantageous to keep the infant about 20 centimeters below the level of the placenta for about 30 seconds after its extraction before clamping the umbilical cord to effect a partial placental transfusion, which I find poorly supported since they did not even study 20 centimeters below. If we look for more current evidence, I can point to two other papers. First, the APTS trial again. The protocols ask the investigators to hold the baby, quote, as low as possible below the introitus. In an analysis of the data, they did find that the lower the baby was held, the lower the likelihood of getting a blood transfusion, perhaps suggesting better placental transfusion of blood to the baby. The next paper by Vane et al. compared just two levels, holding the baby at the level of the introitus or laying the baby on the mother's abdomen. In their trial, there was no difference in these two heights, which might suggest laying the baby on mom's abdomen for skin to skin while doing delayed cord clamping is just fine versus trying to hold the baby below the level of the placenta. Does time matter? Short answer, yes. We go back to our friends Yao and Lind. In a different paper, they found the max transfusion occurred by three minutes, and additional times did not increase transfusion volume. Two papers have been more recently published, both using hematocrit as the outcome. The first from 2006 showed hematocrit was highest in the group that received three minutes of delayed cord clamping. The second found that 60 seconds was adequate, but there was a clear trend for higher hematocrit in three minutes that was just not significant. Why cord pulsations? I have to say, this practice has always puzzled me. One day, I heard an OB colleague of mine announce that they were going to wait until the cord pulsation ceased and then clamp the cord. After the baby was done transitioning, I pulled the OB aside and asked curiously why the cord pulsations mattered. Because in my mind, the pulsations tell me about the blood pumping out of the baby into the placenta, and why would this help me know when to clamp? The OB colleague looked at me and said, astonished, so I'm not the only one that has thought of that? I knew then I better look into this practice more. Fortunately, I was able to find this paper by Bohr et al., where they measured cord flow by Doppler, both in the venous and arterial cord vessels. They showed that venous flow, the one going from placenta to the baby, continues for about four and a half minutes after birth. Arterial flow lasts the same amount of time, but the rest they found was fascinating. They had 12 infants where the Doppler showed no flow whatsoever in the cord, but 11 of those babies were determined by the midwife, who was blinded to the Doppler, to still have cord pulsations. And just as interesting, in those where the midwives determined there was no pulsation and were clamping the cord, the Doppler showed that 43% of those babies still had arterial flow. The conclusion in the paper was that there is no relation between cord pulsations and umbilical flow. What about cord milking? First, I would direct you to this paper by Dr. Blank working with Dr. Hooper. The changes in carotid blood pressure and flow with cord milking in the animal models is concerning. But the clinical data in preterm babies from Dr. Katheria, who's done a lot of studies with delayed cord clamping, was actually promising. In a two-center study, he showed some better early measures of hemodynamic stability with umbilical cord milking, and the follow-up studies showed some better neural developmental outcomes. But then the larger multi-center study had to be stopped early because there was a large increase in severe IVH, especially in babies 23 to 27 weeks. We are talking about 22% severe IVH in the cord milking group compared to 6% in the delayed cord clamping group. So cord milking for preterm babies has a lot of concerns at this time. That multicenter trial is actually proceeding with caution for the older gestational age preterm babies, and it will be interesting to see those results in the end. What about resuscitation on an open cord? This is taking physiology-based cord clamping to its logical conclusion. If it is best for baby to breathe before you clamp, what do you do with those that won't breathe on their own? Well, you breathe for them before you clamp the cord. So far, most trials have shown that this is feasible. There are a few small studies in preterm babies comparing this to regular delayed cord clamping, and so far have shown no difference. 
but they have shown a remarkably high rate of preterm babies spontaneously breathing, even when randomized to the open cord resuscitation. In one study, 92% of babies breathed spontaneously before any positive pressure ventilation was required. So let's sum up the how-to section. I think in practical terms, you can position the baby at the level of the placenta or on the mom. 60 seconds of delayed cord clamping is probably adequate for preterm babies, where there needs to be some balance with need for stabilization by the neonatal team. But for stable term babies, we saw studies where more placental transfusion and better neural developmental outcomes came from longer times of delayed cord clamping, like three minutes. Ignore the cord pulsations. And right now, umbilical cord milking has concerns, especially in the preterm population, and probably should not be routine practice until we know more. Let me ask a question, especially those OB and midwives that may be watching. Got a minute? Because while that baby is staring up at you while we wait for delayed cord clamping, I got some things I need you to do for the baby. In the golden minute after birth, we have to assess the baby while helping dry off the baby and keep it warm. If the baby is not breathing, we have to stimulate the baby and get it breathing. If the baby won't breathe with the stimulation, then we may have to abort delayed cord clamping and clamp so that the newborn team can take over and start the baby breathing with positive pressure ventilation. But I'll share from my experience that it often takes 30 to 45 seconds before the baby starts to breathe during delayed cord clamping. So try to be a little patient while you're stimulating the apneic baby. All this leads me to tell you about the new ABCs of neonatal resuscitation. You all know the ABCs. The new ABCs are airway, breathing, and then clamp. And don't forget D while you're doing the ABCs. Dry the baby and keep the baby warm. My final take-homes. I think all babies should receive delayed cord clamping. Notice I did not say all babies will receive it. There are definitely contraindications, and you must collaborate and discuss which babies can get delayed cord clamping. But I think the evidence for it is getting very good at this time, and it is relatively simple intervention to do with possibly big impacts and important outcomes. Right now, I would say aim for 60 seconds of delayed cord clamping in preterm babies, but longer in stable term babies, where three minutes seems doable and good for babies. Don't forget to warm, dry, and stimulate while waiting to clamp the cord. And I am pretty convinced by the animal data and the limited human data that physiology-based cord clamping is the correct way to go. So a breathing baby really is the primary goal before cord clamping, just like Dr. Darwin and Dr. Dewey's told us 200 years ago. Thank you for watching. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Please leave a comment with any questions or thoughts you have. I'd love to learn from you. Follow me on these platforms if you want to continue to hear from me or send me a direct message.